Hi everyone, it's Ellie from The Curious Geographer and welcome to our summer schedule. Um, we have a new um, poster here, everything that's coming up this term, so some really interesting live interviews coming up, so set the reminder on YouTube and on the link on the bottom normally. Um, and also if you haven't already, scan the QR code which is um, over here and then you can get a live um, poster with what's going on and interactive links as well. Um, so today we're really, really lucky. Um, okay, my no, my internet is just losing a bit of strength. So hopefully it's going to come through in a sec. Um, right, so today we're really, really lucky to be joined. Hold on, I'm just going to... Okay, I've got a message saying it's good, but it looks like it's just gone um, for a second. Um, Right, so yeah, today we're really, really lucky to be joined by um, Stephen Leahy, who is an award-winning international journal environmental journalist and also author who has covered international environmental issues for more than 20 years. So really, really lucky. So you might have read, without maybe knowing it, um, some of his um, what amazing work in the National Geographic, The Guardian, um, lots of different resources as well. And he's based in Toronto, so we're really lucky to be joined um, from across, across the world. And then later we'll be talking about um, his book also, which is called Your Water Footprint, the shocking facts behind our thirst for Earth's most precious resource. Um, but today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about tar sands in Canada and learning a bit about them and potentially why they are the most destructive in, like, industrial um, um, infrastructure that is occurring in the world today and what is the impact with extracting tar um, sands as well. So if I pass over to um, Stephen, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself to us and just telling us um, yeah, a bit about just what you do um, as your kind of day-to-day -day, um, career. Oh, hi, Ali. It's uh, very nice to be here. Um, yeah, I've been an environmental journalist for oh, 25 years now, I guess. Um, so I like to write about uh, nature, wildlife, and environmental issues. And particularly in the last 10 or 15 years, I've done a lot of writing about climate change and energy. Um, so uh, my sort of day-to-day -day thing is I'm always looking for a story, and I'll pitch a story to a publication with a couple of paragraphs of what I think that the story is going to be about. Um, something I think people need to know about. I mean, really, that's what my prime motivator is. I think, gee, I think people need to know about things like the tar sands, or I need to find things that people would, uh, you know, uh, find interesting and maybe um, do something about to maybe let their politicians know or become involved in some issue like water pollution or air pollution. Brilliant. And today we are going to be talking about the tar sands and um, we talked a little bit earlier about how when I teach students, um, everybody's just really shocked at particularly the scale um, of the tar sands and how environmentally um, polluting they are and how they impact environments and habitats as well so, and people. Um, so we're going to be talking about you've, you've researched them, you've published articles on them and you've visited them. Um, yourself so kind of really actually hear what it's like from um, you as a journalist um, so I think to kind of start off because um, mainly people let students learn about it at um, a level we're saying so kind of what are tar sands um, and why would why does Canada why is Canada able to extract tar sands and why do they want to extract this energy um, yeah so the tar sands is a you know, underlying is, is a huge deposit in uh, northern Alberta and part of Saskatchewan and central Canada. And so it's a tarry substance that's under the ground. Uh, some places it's not very deep, maybe 20, 30 meters. Uh, other places it's quite a bit deeper. Um, so this tarry substance is called bitumen. Um, so it's not oil per se, It's and it's not very easy to get out. Um, so a lot of uh, engineering had to go into figuring out how to get this out. One of the reasons the uh, billions of dollars were spent is there's a huge amount of it. Technically, 1.2 trillion barrels of oil could be extracted, although most of that would be too expensive. Um, still, there's many, many billions of barrels of potential oil uh, there. So the... Um, uh, way in which you get at the oil is to, uh, or get at the uh, bitumen, 
is you dig it up out of the ground uh, with the, these huge industrial mining uh, uh, machines. Um, and another way is by boiling it out of the ground. Um, I can go into more detail if you want, but <clears throat> generally speaking, the area that's being, um, where this bitumen is being extracted is something like a thousand square kilometers currently. And that's the most recent number, which is a few years old. So it's, it's a larger area than that. Um, and so quite a huge area of uh, Northern Alberta is being uh, severely impacted with what is uh, considered the largest industrial project in the world. And just to put that into perspective, you said, um, did you say 100,000 kilometers square? Uh, 1,000 square, 1, 1, square kilometers 1,000 square, yeah. 1, square kilometers. And the actual, the, the deposits, which aren't all um, extracted um, as a resource, is over um, 140,000 kilometers um which is about the size of the which is about the size of england so there's loads of deposits and i think it's isn't it the third land largest oil um resource deposits in the world um after venezuela and i don't know the other place <laughs> um yeah yeah after yeah um so yeah there's low there's lots of resources there and it's just i think some of the images that we're going to be showing as you talk about it is what is extracting this um this what tar sands what does it do and can you tell us why exactly is it called tar sands like what why isn't it just kind of extracting oil yeah so the um the uh, the material that the tar is actually as i say it's a bitum so it's a really sticky gooey uh substance like a taffy or something that's mixed in with sand and clay and other sediments so it's it's uh it's not a big pool of oil or a big pocket of say coal it's spread out to this huge area uh, and all mixed up with all this material um, so the first main way of getting it out is to literally dig down 60 70 meters uh, dig it up and then process the material. So several tons of material has to be dug up to get a little bit of, of this tarry substance out. And it, it gets removed by uh, using a lot of heat, steam, and some chemicals to get it to break down. The other method to get at it for deposits of uh, bitumen that are deeper than, say, 60 or 70 meters is to drill holes into the, into the ground and then send down superheated steam uh, to melt it, and then there's uh, drill in other parts uh, further away, and sort of have like a big straw to suck the uh, superheated uh, melted bitumen out. Um, so there's you know there's it's a hugely in energy intensive uh, process. Both of them, they use about one third of all the natural gas resources in Canada uh, are, that are uh, just to, just to get it out of the ground. And from a weird energy point of view, it takes way more energy to get it out of the ground than you get actually get it when you uh, uh, use the oil. Wow! So it takes more energy. You said it takes energy to actually get out the oil yeah. from the ground. Um, and I mainly read it's mainly going to the U.S. U.S. Um, export imports a lot of the the oil from the tar sands. Yeah. So there's. So the about three million barrels a day is now being pumped out of the or, or taken out of the tar sands uh, and shipped to the U.S. Uh, th through pipelines or through rail cars. Uh, when it's shipped uh, or piped, it has to be diluted because even after it's processed and taken out of the ground and boiled and all the rest of it, it still has to be diluted because it's so gooey it won't flow on a pipeline. So it's 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 another term for it called dilutant, uh, and, and so it becomes what's known as dill bit. So that way there it can actually flow through a pipeline. But then it's processed in the U.S. because very little processing of this uh, really heavy, heavy crude oil is done in Canada. We just don't have the uh, refineries for it. And it takes a special kind of refinery to, uh, you know, basically deal with what is the sort of bottom of the barrel oil because it's the worst quality of oil there is. Yes, yeah, so it's, the, it's the worst quality of oil there is. You're using more energy to potentially get out the oil to use the energy 
And also you can't even transport it because it's so sticky and tar-like, so you have to move it across. So the big kind of question we're talking about today is why, well, we haven't even talked about the impacts, but why is Canada exporting this when we're trying to go to more of a renewable future? Um, so what are the benefits for Canada? Is it just that they can use this and it's on their their area, so they're not having to, say, import oil from other countries? Is that one reason why they're... Um, extracting from tar sands? No, Canada still imports a lot of oil from other countries, so we don't actually use uh, that oil. It's not really, very little of it is being used in Canada. Um, it's the uh, financial part. The uh, It's the weird economics of, uh, say, natural gas energy versus oil. So natural gas is considered extremely cheap um, because there's lots of it, and, and lots of it in Canada. Canada is one of the biggest uh, sources of natural gas. Uh, and oil prices are higher than uh, gas prices, so there's money to be made. Um, despite you know all these hurdles, um, you can still make money, billions of dollars, uh, by selling, uh, by going through this elaborate process to get it out of the ground. Yeah. And as far as Canada and its uh, you know its net zero goals, well, it's it's the biggest hurdle uh, that Canada has. Mm-hmm. And we'll talk a bit about that later. So. You uh, yourself have visited um, the tar sands. So, what impact? Um, what impacts are the tar sands on the environment? Um, but also, what it, was it like when you actually went there? What did it look like? Because it, it used to be on kind of boreal forest is the area where tar sands are. The deposits are under. So, can you tell us a bit about your experience of the tar sands and the environmental impacts? Yeah. So, the northern Alberta is almost all uh, boreal forest. Um, so, uh, so it's a very flat area uh, because it, once upon a time, this whole area uh, was uh, the bottom of a giant inland sea. Much of the central part of North America was this huge inland sea millions of years ago. Um, so it's quite flat. It has a lot of um, uh, bogs and a lot of uh, wetlands and streams. So it's quite a wet area. Very, very green, very lush. So for miles and miles and miles, it's just uh, you know green and forest. There's quite a bit of wildlife in terms of uh, caribou and uh, bear and deer and uh, uh, other wildlife. The uh, process of getting at this means you have to remove the trees, you have to dig up the ground. So when I went there with my family years ago, um, you can't actually see very much from the highways or the roads because they keep a screen of trees up. So you can't see what's on the other side. Of, uh, so the trees block your view, except for a few places where it's just this, uh, it looks like a gig- war zone where the ground is all turned up and churned up um, and nothing grows once this material is dug up out of the ground and processed. Uh, it's very hard to reclaim the land Um, The other thing that's super noticeable is these gigantic uh, waste ponds. So there's something like 200, 250 square kilometers of wastewater ponds. And these are toxic lakes, basically. Uh, You have to keep all the birds out because if a bird gets, you know, happens to say a duck, um, it could easily kill it. Um, So there's actually a whole elaborate process to keep scare them away. Um, But then walking by one of these ponds, your eyes burn, your throat sore because these ponds ponds contain these, uh, I guess, a whole variety of chemicals that they're off-gassing from from the actual water. Um, So the air in the region is pretty nasty. Um, It's a a pretty unhealthy environment to be working in and certainly to be living in. And you talked about those, the ponds, the toxic ponds. So they're tailing ponds where they just, what do they actually do with that? Why do they use the, that water, um, the ponds? Well, they use the water to get, it's part of the process of getting the tar uh, out of the uh, sand and the, and the clay and the mud that, 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 that the material's all wrapped up in. So to remove uh, that, they use a lot of water. Huge amounts of water are used throughout this uh, tar sands uh, process. Um, and then the water becomes contaminated, it becomes too, uh, can't recycle it because it's too contaminated with chemicals and other materials, uh, fine clays, some other stuff, 
uh, that they can't, the industry can't use it. So they stick them in these gigantic ponds um, one day to reclaim them, but it's been 50 years and they still haven't been able to reclaim any of them uh, or clean up the water. So one of the big risks uh, is that a lot of these tailings ponds are along the Athabasca River, which is you know sort of considered the Mississippi of uh, North uh, of uh, Canada. It's a gigantic river that flows to the Arctic, um, um, and uh, because these ponds are right beside the river, um, there's some leakage underground, and there's so, always a worry that one of these uh, tailings ponds will collapse, and the toxic material will get in the Athabasca, which would be a, a huge disaster. And you talked about the fact that when you um, went there, you could actually like smell the fumes. Is that correct? Of how polluted it was? Yeah, it's it's not nearly it's not so obvious to see it, but you can feel it in your eyes and your throat gets sore. Uh, we walked uh, for I don't know fifteen kilometers, I guess, through some of these areas um, with some indigenous folks um, when I was there, and uh, yeah, it's. You find yourself very short of breath after a while. Um, it's uh, it's quite a unpleasant. So, the, so air pollution is is a major issue there. Um, some of the readings show it to have some of the worst air quality. You know, outside of the um, say some of the cities in uh, Asia, say uh, New Delhi, which has legendary for its horrible air pollution. Um, and this is, of course, in a formerly pristine area in northern Alberta, where hardly anybody actually lives. Um, so the air pollution is, is a serious problem. It also acid rain because of the uh, uh, material that's through the processing um, ends up producing a lot of uh, sulfur dioxide, which is you know contaminating the, the local waterways as well. Yeah. And the um, just to confirm that this used to be, it's not like it used to be disused land. This used to be forest with natural habitats as well. So it's kind of, not only have you got all the kind of toxic ponds and wasteland, but it was before a habitat which was untouched. Um, so that's kind of making it kind of even worse as well. Um, yeah. can we, you talked about the fact you walked through the lands of the indigenous people and it's not only animals and habitats um, that are being impacted. So can, do you mind telling us what are some of the impacts on the local people who used to live around the forest as well, um, and in particular the First Nations? Well, it's had a big impact on their uh, the whole lives, that's for sure. Um, so, for instance, one of the things, of course, is their uh, ability to get food from the land. So what they call country food. So that's food they would hunt or fish. Uh, so the animals, of course, have gone. Uh, a lot of the animals like deer and caribou are, are very hard to find now um, because of the, uh, all this activity. Uh, the, the fish, which is a major, was a major uh, food source for them. Um, a lot of fish have shown have uh, been contaminated, uh, and so people are actually afraid to eat the fish now. Um, there's been health impacts because many of the communities live downstream from uh, the uh, tar sands operation, so they're um, um, basically getting some of the air pollution as well as the water pollution. And there's been some cases of very rare cancers uh, amongst the indigenous people. It's been highly disruptive for their communities as well. Um, their territories have been, of course, uh, taken over by uh, the industry, um, who promised them jobs, and some and some indigenous people do work there. Um, but you know, and and in some cases, indigenous peoples have given permission of oil industry to uh, set up operations in in their territories simply because they say, well, what choice have we got? We don't have any food to eat. Uh, we're, uh, we're impoverished, at least we'll, some of us will get some jobs. Um, so it's a short-term trade-off uh, for a long-term impact. So they're in a very difficult place. And what was their mood when you were there actually speaking to um, the local people who lived there? Were they, were they angry about it? Were they, um, yeah, what were their, their feelings? Were they like, well, this is now just happening and this is part of our lifestyle? How did they actually feel? Um, there was sort of two, uh, anger, no, it wasn't, wasn't one of them. Uh, one of them was, um, they accept the presence of 
it uh, as it stands because it's here. So they're, realistically, they're pragmatic, um, but they don't want it expanded. Uh, and the industry is often always talking about you know making it bigger, doubling the size, tripling the size. Um, they certainly don't want it to be any larger. Uh, what they want is a transition to more renewable energy. Um, the area has you know good good amount of sunshine. Um, it's quite windy often. They would rather um, the region you know uh, switch from uh, you know dirty oil production to more of a clean energy uh, future. Uh, the, the other um, thing is the belief to take, you know, many, it's hard, I'm not going to try and speak for all indigenous people who live in the region, but um, the elders that I met there said, we're taking the long view that this, the land will heal itself at one point, long time into the future, uh, should stop making things worse, but we want to um, talk about healing um, not only the land, but also people's souls. They also see this sort of destructive operation, this extractive operation, which destroys nature as requiring healing of human souls. So when I was there, they were praying not only for the land to heal, but for um, people, souls to heal, for their spirits to heal. So they see this sort of operation as a disconnect uh, and something, that, a harm that we're doing to ourselves. That's really interesting. Um, it would have been, yeah, I um, actually speaking to people who have been impacted by it from the livelihoods and I really like the idea that obviously, as you said, you can't speak for all of them, but this hopefully won't last and hopefully we'll be able to move forward. Um, I was meant to say um, earlier, but if anybody does have any questions, please do write them um, in the comments because um, there's lots of yeah different things which you might be interested in. So please do write some comments down. Um, so we talked about at the beginning, Canada extracting um, energy and exporting it. However, in 2019, the Canadian government said they wanted um, to scale up the climate action and achieve net zero emissions by 2050. So from your opinion of what you've seen and also just as an environmental journalist as well, do you think this is possible or are the tar sands a contradiction um, to this promise? Uh, first, let me give you a little bit of a context. So already Canada's electricity sector is mostly clean, so about 67% uh, clean energy, add in the 15% of hydro, and so we're already up to 82% of electricity doesn't produce greenhouse grasses. So that's probably better than almost any country. And yet Canada has very high emissions. It's in the top 10 in the world. That's mainly because of the oil and gas industry, which is at least a quarter of Canada's emissions. Um, it's the sector that's growing the fastest. And so over the last, say, 15 or 20 years, you know, Canada's emissions have been growing. They haven't gone down. Um, Canada has never met any of its climate targets, and it's largely due to uh, the oil and gas industry. Um, yesterday, Canada just announced a new target of 36% uh, reduction by 2030. Um, and it's expected they're going to announce another one <laughs> sometime this week at the big White House summit uh, that uh, President Biden is holding on Thursday. Um, I'm not sure. How, I looked at the details. I'm not sure how we could actually uh, manage these targets without constraining the oil and gas industry. Um, it's already close to 300 million tons uh, every year. Um, it's a... It's a um, um, it's the sort of gigantic elephant in the room that has to be dealt with. And it's extremely difficult to deal with. There's been attempts in the past to use technology to um, uh, sequester carbon dioxide and stick it under the ground or do something else with it. Uh, sequester it from the production process. It's been limited in terms of its effectiveness and extremely expensive uh, to do. Um, it's uh, it's something that Canada is going to have to wrestle with, and sadly, you know, Canadians don't quite seem to understand that that's one of the biggest challenges we have right now is how do we uh, meet that net zero goal. Um, 
uh, without you know, completely shifting away from oil and gas, which is what it, that zero goal means. And thank you for putting that in context as well. Yeah, because I think when students, when we learn about it, we think Canada is um, a green place with where they are trans, um, transferring to renewable energy. Um, so it kind of feels like this is just the kind of not so little dirty secret that's kind of going on as you said more and more people are finding out about um we've got a few few questions um if that's okay and if anybody else has any other ones please do add them in um so i'm going to start with pete's one first saying are there any groups that protest against the tar sands um and if so are they successful at all uh yeah there's a lot of groups that have been protesting in canada and from elsewhere um it's it's a it's become I think one of the major uh, things that people do protest when you hear protest about pipelines, say Trans Mountain Pipeline or uh, Keystone XL. That's all about tar sands. Um, so there's a huge movement in the U.S. Uh, same in Canada. Um, there are protests going on right now uh, at various locations. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely an issue that people are very concerned about. Um, and I have a quick question. Actually, when you said when you um, when you actually went there, can people just walk around, or were you? How were you actually able to get access as like a, a journalist as well, or was it because you were with some of the indigenous people? Uh, it's because it was with the indigenous people, but the access is is also very very restricted. Uh, there's uh, they have a lot of security. Um, in public roads, you know, obviously that's not so bad. You can uh, use those, but. Uh, you're watched while you're there. The the industry is uh, quite uh, conscious of its uh, public image and uh, is uh, careful to uh, ensure that uh, people don't go where they don't want them to go. Um, and Elena has said, um, which isn't really much of a recap, because we talked a bit about what tar sands are, but um, how, like Elena says, why are they there? Um, if you know, kind of, I'm not sure the geography behind it, and also how were they actually, um, how and when were they discovered? Um, they were discovered a long time ago, actually, because the indigenous people uh, used to use the sometimes the tarry substance. You know, there'd be a side of a river bed with cut away, and you could see the tar coming out of it, out of the uh, side of the stream bed uh, or out of the the, the bank. Uh, in the summer, and they'd use it for, you know, repairing, for gluing stuff together. So it was pretty good as a glue. So it's been known by indigenous people for a long time. Um, explorers, of course, in the 1890s and 1800s uh, also, you know, thought this was kind of a neat thing because they'd never seen anything like that before and so thought it was useful. Nobody thought of it in terms of oil for a long time. Um, uh, in terms of, because I mentioned earlier that there was this gigantic lake millions of years ago, or Yes, in the inland sea, really. Uh, and of course, you know, things uh, died, went to the bottom. You know, the normal process for making oil uh, and gas, the, the millions and millions of years, it's, it's vegetable matter and animal matter that ends up under pressure uh, that uh, turns, you know, basically um, things that we used to be on the surface turns them into oil over a period of time. I'm not precisely sure why bitumen or tar is, uh, you know, why why that ended up being that way instead of oil. I suspect it has to do with not as much uh, pressure, or it might have been another reason. Um, and there's there's a question from Claire. I'm going to turn it slightly round um, to, um, to about kind of waste and the tailings ponds. Um, how is it possible to dispose of waste kind of in a more environmentally friendly way do you see there being a solution to tailings ponds um the the industry is aware of the problem because it's a huge amount of water usage and and sometimes this area actually um, experiences droughts um so they're trying to clean it up and uh, reuse the water more and more often um and there's been a limited amount of success um, it's hard to remove certain types of chemicals once they're in the water. Um, filtration systems don't really work. Um, there's been a lot of science and research aimed at that. Um, it's 
it's just one of these things that's become very difficult to to uh, to do. I guess it's part of it might be the cost effectiveness of how much does it cost to do this. Um, so it's, it's still a, a, a big issue that we still need to solve. And in your opinion, in 50 years time and 100 years time, do you see the tar stands still being in Alberta? Do you see them growing? Do you see them actually be more environmentally sustainable? What would you say, 50 years and 100 years? Well, certainly 50 years, uh, I don't see much of an operation at all. Uh, it still will be in the cleanup phase uh, because by that time, um, oil use will be uh, very minimal to specialize things for maybe plastics. We're not going to be burning it. Um, electric vehicles are coming very quickly. Um, I wrote something recently that said, you know, within 10 years, majority of vehicles sold in the world will be electric and that'll have a huge impact on oil sales so the three million barrels uh, that Canada is producing most of it is turned into uh, fuel for cars into gasoline um, so that market will uh, disappear as it's the most difficult <coughs> oil to get and the most expensive to get out of the ground uh, it'll likely be the first one on the chopping block as the uh, world shifts to clean energy Brilliant. I really like that because I, often in geography, we talk about um, different scales of things for A-level geography and also looking at the future as well. So really like that link that you sort of said, actually, will there be as much need for it as people are moving to electric cars? Um, and a good fact that you said potentially more in, t in 10 years, more cars might be electric um, being sold. We're having a lot of changes in London with our ultra low emission zone as well, trying to promote people to go to more kind of energy efficient cars. Um, and you have written a book, if we kind of go on to this in about like careers as well. Um, so mm -hmm. you wrote a book called Your Water Footprint, shocking facts about how much water we use to make everyday products. Um, so can you tell us a little bit what um, a lot of students might, because we learn also about not um, water and water use. So can you tell us a little bit about what is your book about? I'll put a link as well um, in the comments below. Um, and also, how did you end up, you didn't go straight into environmental journalists, so could you tell us a little bit about thinking in terms of careers, how did you decide to go down the route of environmental journalism? Yeah, so the, the water book is um, uh, a look at how much water does it take to make things. Um, and much to my surprise when I researched it, I, I hadn't realized that we need water to make anything, clothing, lights, you know, energy. Uh, books, computers, uh, uh, oil, uh, all these, you know, things that we sort of take for granted, they all required water um, to uh, produce. Um, and then there's some research uh, from out of the, you know, in the Netherlands, they looked at, how, well, how much water does it take to make a book? How much water does it take to make a, a cell phone? And they did enormous amounts of research, and I worked with them to, you know, sort of break it down and explain uh, how much water it takes to make uh, a cell phone. Uh, I would like to quote the numbers, but I haven't done a presentation on this for a while. Uh, it's quite a few. Uh, it's a lot more water than you think. So I think I remember that a, a, a regular uh, cheeseburger was like 2,400. Uh, liters of water, a t-shirt, you know, pair of jeans, thousands of liters of water. So that's the water it takes to actually, um, say, grow, say it's, it's plant material, or to provide food for a cow. Um, it also means how much water went through processing, how much water went into the shipping, all the sort of components. And the water consumed, the sense of water is, is uh, consumed, uh, means that this is water that's tied up for that particular use. It doesn't mean the water is actually in the product. Um, it just means it's, it's something that um, we've allocated for this particular purpose and we can't use it for anything else. Um, and sometimes it takes a long time before we could actually use that water again because say it, it evaporates. Well, who knows where that water is gonna go again. As, 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 as all your students know, the water cycle is closed. Uh, so the water on the planet Earth is the same as it was dinosaurs roamed. Um, but it's how we use the water. Um, so the, the book 
is about the enormous amounts of water that we consume um, and the fact that we often don't use water very wisely. Places that are super dry, you know, grow, you know, fruits that take a lot of water to grow. Um, so these are some things that come up in the book. Uh, as for my sort of career choice, I did go to uni to study journalism, but I wasn't, I was there actually to play basketball. Um, I didn't actually care what course I was in, but it was the only one that seemed interesting. Um, and through a strange set of circumstances, I ended up being editor of the college newspaper. Um, uh, and you know, decided, yeah, I really do like, and I don't mind journalism at all, but I couldn't find a career in it at, to begin with. So I worked in, uh, marketing, uh, in a publishing company for a few years, uh, and a couple of other companies ended up being a marketing executive for a while. And they decided that this was not a, a good use of my time or my interests. I was more interested in outdoor things. I was interested in environment and nature. Uh, and I wanted to be at home more often instead of in meetings in you know downtown Toronto all the time. Um, my kids were young at the time, um, and I wanted to be outside a lot more. Um, and so I decided to um, try freelance journalism um, and then to be able to write about things that I thought were important that people needed to know about um, uh, and things that I wanted to learn about. So one of the great things about being a journalist is you get to learn new things every day. Um, and then to sort of help you understand the thing you're learning is it by writing so that other people can understand that, it, you know, sort of helps me uh, actually understand what I'm writing about by the process of writing. Um, so folks, anybody who wants to be a journalist, I'd say, uh, you know, if you want to be an environmental journalist, it helps to have some science. I did take science. Uh, I've been to three different universities. So, um, so I had done science as well. Um, so, Interest in science is helpful. Um, curiosity is a key component as well. Ask questions. There's never a dumb question. And I really like what you actually said is that at, sometimes we, we go down one route and we're not sure and then it changes. And sometimes I think in school it kind of makes it seem that students need to know their careers and actually you can kind of find your place um, and change as well um, what you want mm -hmm. to do. Um, and then I suppose what obviously you have to be curious as the curious geographer asking questions. Um, what is there one thing that I remember, what I really liked is that you like learning new things and also sharing that. So kind of my final question from you is that, is there anything that in particular that you have really enjoyed researching and spreading the word about um, from any of the environmental journalism that you've done? Um, yeah, I'd say the, um, uh, I've been lucky enough to spend a lot of time with indigenous peoples in their home territories um, and understanding their way of seeing the world is very different. Um, and that's really broadened my understanding of, of, of life and the world. Um, uh, they have a un unique perspective from a Western science-y point of view. It's equally valid and, and frankly, it's something we need to uh, incorporate into our own thinking and our own ways of seeing the world. Um, They've predicted a lot of things as what happened. There's some of their ancient uh, <clears throat> cultures and traditions seem to be pretty accurate about how we are transforming the world. Um, so I think we could uh, learn a, a lot from them. And uh, so I'm happy to be able to have had those experiences and to share some of their um, some of their wisdom with uh, people. Brilliant. Well, thank you so, so much um, for uh, being live with us all the way from over in um, near Toronto in Canada. Um, it's been really interesting and as you said, hearing your views um, about being with Indigenous people and walking through the tar sands, actually speaking to someone who has visited them, um, just drop something on the floor, <laughs> um, is really fantastic as well. So from us at Watching the Curious Geographer, thank you very, very much um, and we wish you the best of luck with your future um, articles that you're going off to research as well. Thank you. Nice to and just to let everybody know for next um, 
in a couple of weeks time um we're just having an introduction to feminist geography um by katie Wal and walter and so if you are interested in anything to that with a level um normally it's studied at university um so yeah tune into that to learn a little bit about what do we mean by feminist geography how can we understand um the world with that so um from me at the coast geographer um hope everybody is enjoying the summer term um enjoy some of the sun and i will see you in a couple of weeks